scripture today is John 3, verses 1 to 21. Um, this uh, scripture is the setting for the very, um, very uh, popular um, verse that I, I remember. It's the first verse I re that I uh, had to memorize when I was a child. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So uh, you'll notice this is the setting that comes uh, from that scripture. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven excuse me, from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses, Moses lifted up the serpents in the wilderness, so the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world for all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Our next scripture comes from uh, Numbers 21, 4 to 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against, against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? There's no food, no water. We detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze 
and left. In the Gospel of John, very early on in his ministry, there's somebody who comes to visit Jesus. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, comes to visit Jesus at night. That's weird. That's all kinds of weird. Why exactly would a man of that kind of power and status slink around in a dark alley at night to come visit Jesus under the cover of darkness? As it turns out, that is not the only weird thing about this scripture from the Gospel of John. In fact, it's one of, the, one of many strange things that shows up in this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. See, there's a lot of strange stuff in this scripture, and most of that is on purpose. The Gospel of John is a little bit different than the other three Gospels. See, the point of the Gospel of John is, well, to tell this deeper story about who Jesus is, this spiritual story. And it's not necessarily to follow the exact storyline of Jesus' life. John moves things all around in order, to, in order to make some very important points about who Jesus is. John uses, well, a lot of double meanings and hidden metaphors and word plays and allusions to other scriptures. He layers all sorts of things in a very interesting kind of way. And this conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus is actually a good example of how John layers some things together. We can even see some layers when we look at when this conversation happens, even before it gets going. See, here we have a conversation with Jesus talking to Nicodemus about how people can enter the kingdom of God by being born of the Spirit and not just born of the flesh. How Jesus makes that possible by being lifted up and how people can come to eternal life by coming to the light and away from the darkness. It's a conversation about a huge term that we might call salvation. And when does this conversation happen? Well, if we read just a verse or two right before this, it happens during the Jewish festival of Passover. What does Passover celebrate? Passover celebrates and remembers the story of the Jews being freed from slavery in Egypt. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus about salvation at the same time the Jews are celebrating the core story of God's salvation. You see how John begins to layer things even before the conversation has started. So, here we are very early on in Jesus' ministry during the festival of Passover, and Nicodemus, the Pharisee, comes to visit Jesus in the middle of the night. Now Nicodemus, this is an interesting guy for a bunch of reasons. He's a very interesting character in the story. It says that he was a Pharisee. Now the way that the Gospel of John writes uh, the story, John writes the story, the Pharisees are the villains. Now, they most certainly weren't as bad as John makes them out to be, but, but in the Gospel of John, the Pharisees are out to get Jesus. They are the ones who want to arrest and kill Jesus as soon as possible. What's more, under no circumstances would the Pharisees ever want to admit publicly that Jesus has anything to do with God in any way, shape, or form. And here is Nicodemus, a Pharisee a leader of the Jews, coming to Jesus and saying to him, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs apart from the presence of God. Nicodemus is a Pharisee who recognizes something in Jesus that others don't see. Nicodemus sees when the other Pharisees are blind. When you look forward in the story of the Gospel of John, we actually see that Nicodemus shows up two other times, once in the middle and once at the end. Another time in the middle and the end of the story. About halfway through the story in chapter 7, the Pharisees are plotting to have Jesus arrested and killed. And in this secret meeting, Nicodemus pipes up and actually defends Jesus. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on guys, we can't just arrest somebody without giving them a fair hearing first. At which point the rest of the Pharisees turn on him and say, what, are you on his side? Then, later on in the story, after Jesus dies on the cross, Nicodemus shows up again. And he's the one who brings a hundred pounds of burial spices and ointment.
to make sure that Jesus' body is buried properly. Nicodemus is a character that only shows up in the Gospel of John. He's not in the other Gospels. And he is incredibly fascinating to me because there is this story arc of a man who should be one of the villains. But he's someone who recognizes something important in Jesus, who sticks up for Jesus in a key moment, and somebody who eventually becomes a follower of Jesus by the end. Which means, we can see, which means that we can see this conversation as the beginning of Nicodemus's conversion story, which I find fascinating. Now, like I said, the conversion that Nicodemus, or the conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus have, has is a fascinating one. And it's one that is filled with double meanings throughout the whole thing. And those double meanings drive the whole conversation forward. Jesus uses these words with double meanings in order to confuse Nicodemus and to raise questions in his head in order to teach him something new. There are four sort of double meanings that I see that are worth paying attention to in this story. The first of which is that Nicodemus is coming in the dark in order to see the light of the world. In the beginning of the gospel, John starts by telling us that Jesus is the light of the world and the darkness will never put out that light. This is something that comes up at the end of the conversation too, where when Jesus talks about the way that people are really saved from their sins is by coming into the light and going away from the darkness. In some ways, Nicodemus himself is a metaphor for coming to the light and leaving the darkness. But I'll talk more about that in a second. The next big double meaning is one that we may have heard before, but it's worth saying again. And it has to do with this phrase, being born again. The word again in Greek is, again, has a double meaning. It can mean again as in to repeat something, or it can mean from above. So Jesus is using this in kind of an interesting way. He tells Nicodemus that he needs to be born from above, but, Jesus, but Nicodemus hears he has to be born again, and he gets confused. I mean, how can you go back into your mother's womb and be born again physically? That's what Nicodemus first hears. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He says, no, 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 you have to be born from above. He's talking about this spiritual rebirth a birth that is necessary to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in particular here. It requires our first physical birth, but then a second spiritual birth. Another double meaning comes right after that as well, and it has to do with the word for wind. Right after Jesus says you have to be born from above, he says, the wind blows as it chooses, and you hear it, and when you hear the sound of it, you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, in Greek means wind, and it also means spirit. So in that verse, the word wind at the beginning and the word spirit at the end are the same. The wind slash spirit blows where it chooses. So it is with everyone who is born of the wind slash spirit. Spirit. It's the same word. And again, it thoroughly confuses Nicodemus. But then finally, there is this whole thing about being lifted up. Now, look, y'all, we got to talk about this one. Because this is where things get weird in a hurry. This whole thing of Moses lifting up a snake in the desert and Jesus needing to be lifted up by that, this gets bizarre quick. Or at least part of it does. First of all, there is a double meaning in the phrase to be lifted up here. Actually, it's a triple meaning. It does mean to be physically lifted up. But Jesus is also using the phrase when the Son of Man is lifted up. He means his crucifixion. That's going to come later on in the story. But interesting in the, interestingly, in the Gospel of John, the crucifixion itself also has a double meaning. The crucifixion would have been seen as this huge loss but instead, Jesus uses that to say, no, 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 the Son of Man is lifted up and is exalted and is glorified. What looks like a loss is actually the victory. That is his establishing of his kingship. There's at least three meanings going on when Jesus talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. But that may not be the weird part. The weird part 
is that Jesus says that the Son of Man must be lifted up just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now this is the point where you all need to be asking the question, um, <clears throat> what's the deal with the snake in the wilderness and why does Jesus refer to that and compare himself to that? Because that's a valid question. That story about the snake in the wilderness is a super obscure thing. And it's kind of strange for Jesus to compare himself to that story. There are three references to this snake that Moses lifts up in the wilderness in the Bible. One from Numbers, which we read this morning. One from 2 Kings, which I'll tell you about in just a second. And then one from the Gospel of John. It's just three. That's it. It's a very strange thing. And the Old Testament references themselves are very odd. Here's what I mean. In the story from Numbers, we find the people of Israel wandering out in the desert. They have come out of Egypt. They've been set free. They've gone across the Red Sea. They've gone to Mount Sinai. And they're wandering around, and they start to complain. Imagine that. That's kind of what they do, at least in the desert. It's sort of a general complaint, both against God and Moses. But at the core of it, basically, the sin is that they have grown impatient with God and it is a lack of trust in God to provide for them. And because of that sin, God sends a plague of snakes, fiery snakes, to bite them, and a whole bunch of people die. At which point, they realize what they've done, and they repent. They cry out to God and say, God, we were wrong. Please come heal us and save us. Now, what's interesting here is that, is that God does not take away the snakes. The snakes are still there. Instead, God tells Moses to make this serpent, this snake, and put it up on the end of a pole. And anybody who looks at that will be healed. Now, this is weird for a bunch of reasons, but the biggest one is that remember where we are in the story. Remember that we are wandering around in the desert, which means we have just come from Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, we got the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, there is one of the laws that is very clear. That you shall not make an idol of anything in heaven or below the earth or on earth. Nothing. No idols, period. Remember the golden calf thing? That whole debacle? Yeah. Idols are a problem. They've just heard that. Here is a story with God telling Moses to make a big bronze snake which looks an awful lot like an idol. This is weird. <laughs> and again, this, not, this is not too far out in left field because when you fast forward another 700 years and you get to the second reference about this thing in the Old Testament from 2 Kings, what you find is during a reform, during King Hezekiah's time, he clears out a bunch of idols that have worked their way into the temple and he names which ones he clears out and among them is this bronze snake that Moses put up in the desert. And by that point, the people have given this thing a name and have started offering incense to it and worshiping it as an idol, as a god. I asked a seminary professor of mine, an old seminary professor this week, uh, what the deal with this snake is, and particularly this whole idol thing, and why Jesus would reference it. And his official theological, well-reasoned, academic response was, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's weird. It's real weird. Look, there's stuff in the Bible that you just kind of go, yep, it's in there. Don't know. And this is one of those that really is kind of odd for a whole bunch of reasons. The story about Moses lifting up a bronze snake in the wilderness is a really weird story because it doesn't really fit with Israel's history. And it's even weirder that Jesus pulls this story out of their history and compares his own impending death to this story about a snake being lifted up. This is bizarre. And we could forgive Nicodemus a little bit for not catching up and being confused by all of this. So, what is Jesus saying here? Why did he bring this up? Well, I think, I think the reason or, or the connection that we can find is when we ask a question 
of both the snake story and of also the conversation in John. And that question is, how exactly is it that salvation happens, that healing happens in both of these stories? Time out. Before I talk about that, my guess is that when I use the word salvation, or Jesus saves, or lifted up on the cross, that most of you in here have a very specific idea of what you think that means and how you think that works. We all do. What I need you to know today, I'm going to talk about this in a few weeks, but what I need you to know today is that whatever you have in your mind is only one of a bunch of ways to understand all of that. And for the moment, I need you to try and set your assumptions aside and listen to what's in the text. Because what you have in your head may or may not actually fit with what Jesus is talking about. Okay. How does healing and salvation happen in the snake story and in the, go in the Gospel of John? Well, for starters, in the story from, the, from Numbers, remember that the snakes are there because of the people's sin, they are, which is really, not, really about not trusting God. The snakes were a symbol of that sin. The way to healing, to salvation then, <clears throat> is not by getting rid of the snakes. It's not by running away from the sin, not by trying to avoid it. But rather, the way to healing is by holding up the symbol of that sin, which reminds them of where they went off track, and it's a reminder to then trust in God for their healing. The way to healing was not through hiding from their sin, but rather going through their sin. Now, look at the Gospel of John and what Jesus is saying about how salvation is happening. In John, Jesus says that he must be lifted up like the snake in the desert. And then he also says that Jesus has come, or God sent Jesus into the world in order to save the world, which sounds a lot like that snake. Healing comes through Jesus. And then after that, towards the end of this conversation, he says that, yes, there is some judgment involved with this. But what I find interesting here is that the judgment is not necessarily from God. The judgment is something that we do to ourselves in response to what God has done. Jesus says this, and this is the judgment, that the light came into the world, the light being Jesus, and the people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. In Jesus, in this, in this scripture, or in John in this scripture, Jesus is lifted up on the cross. And in doing so, Jesus is a light that exposes everything in this world, including all of our sins. The way to salvation, to healing then, is not to run away from the light, but rather to bring ourselves, our whole selves, into the light in order for things to be exposed. See, here's where I think the connection is between these two stories. Both with Moses and the snake and Jesus and Nicodemus. The way to healing, the way to wholeness, the way to salvation is not by running and hiding away from, from our sin but rather the way to salvation is through our sin. By bringing it out into the open, by owning it and repenting from it and turning back to God. See, I think we can get hung up with this John scripture sometimes when we, we think that this scripture is Jesus talking about his death paying a price to God or to the devil or one of the other atonement theories. But I'm not sure that's really what's going on here. When Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying, I think, is that the cross shines a light on this world and exposes the sin of the world. Everything from sin in our own hearts to big corporate sins to systemic sins that we all participate in. The cross shines a giant light on all of that. And the way to healing, to wholeness, to salvation is by coming to the light, by owning up to our mistakes, our shortcomings, and by asking God to heal us and transform us into something new. And it is that coming into the light that that is what it means to be born from above, to receive a new spirit, to, to live as a new person. 
And then that is how we are able to enter into the kingdom of God. A kingdom that begins here and now and continues on for eternity. There's a lot of weird stuff in this scripture. But I think this is where it hits home for us. As humans, I think we have a tendency to run away when we messed up. When we've made a mistake or when we've hurt someone. And it goes back a long time, all the way back to Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden, running away from God. Our first instinct is to run and hide. I see it myself. I see it in all kinds of other people. I see it in my kids. But the message that we get in this scripture is that redemption, healing, salvation, transformation, forgiveness, shalom, whatever you want to call it, that comes by facing our sins. Not by running away from them, but by bringing them into the light and owning up to the damage that we've done. Humbly asking for forgiveness. It's been my experience over and over and over again, both with God and with other people, that when you try to sweep something under the rug and ignore it and push it away, it doesn't go away. And it keeps following you. It's this thing we keep dragging around, whether we recognize it or not. And the way, the way to get rid of that, the only way to deal with that is really to bring it out into the light, to face it, to deal with it, to work through it. And it is then that we will be able to be set free and to move on to something better that God has in store for us. And so today, my prayer for all of us, starting with me and everybody else, is that we may all come to the light of God without fear. May we come to the light knowing that we will be forgiven, that we will be transformed, made whole in God's powerful love. And may we leave behind that darkness that weighs us down and keeps us in bondage. And may we walk and the newness of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.